Well, the way that Peter Croft has so much energy is I believe he is fueled by coffee and by movie soundtracks. I did not know this. But he's, as he's like out there free soloing the rostrum, he's listening to The Lion King. True story. Actually, I don't know if that's true or not. Because it could be something like gnarly, like Thor. But he is one of those legendary lifers, right? Those individuals like many of us here in the audience that live to climb and climb to live. Please welcome Peter Kroll! Uh, hey, thanks for all you guys showing up. I understand this is like, what, the third presentation you've seen tonight, so Woo! amazing stamina, but I guess that's what happens with Yosemite climbers. Um, I, I really want to thank, boy, um, everybody, Ken, Allison, Ed, all, all the people who, who make this happen, uh, all the volunteers, all the sponsors, and all that kind of stuff, because this is such a cool thing, and I, I've just seen it grow over the years. And so that, it is really cool. Um, it, <laughs> I have to say, it's, it, it's kind of daunting standing in front of a bunch of basically real deal Yosemite climbers. And I, and I, I was driving over from Bishop today, I'm like thinking, man, what do I say to these guys? I mean, like, they've climbed so much of the same stuff I've done. Like, what, what do you say? And the only thing I could really come up with was that as much as we try to... I don't know, become better climbers. Um, all too often we get stuck in the idea of, boy, if, if I can climb 510 or 513, you know, more boys or girls will like me, or like that kind of thing. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe it happened to you. I don't know. It didn't happen to me. Um, but but in, in, in the end, the thing that's always really surprised me is this idea of, Along the way, there's all these unexpected things. You're aiming towards one thing, and these unexpected things happen along the way that kind of teach you lessons or just become bizarre things that are just kind of hallmarks in, in your life. So um, anyway, I guess we'll just start. Along the way, I'll just kind of sort of touch on some of these weird things that happen that make climbing, I don't know, at least for me, what it is. Ed, I think I'm present. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here we are. This is the same cliff. So that was my other, my buddy who I, it was my next door neighbor. And so here I am on this climb. And, and so I've been climbing for a number of years at this time. And so now we've gone to this cliff and I've decided I want to try to do, it's the hardest climb in all of Canada. And I am so jacked. And, you know, when you're trying to be, a, a, I guess, a real athlete, Focus is so important. You need to focus on exactly what you're doing and try to like phase out everything else. So at the beginning of this day, or actually the beginning of the day when I was first going to try this climb, we go to the, the coffee shop and uh, we go in there. And at this time I didn't warm up, so it, it was just basically, you know, you get on the hardest thing, first thing. So I go in there, get the biggest stack of pancakes they have, and we head out to the car. And I'm just, I am so amped. I'm going to try the hardest climb in all of Canada. This is... This is where I grew up. This is like the, the most important climbing area of Canada. This is, I am so jacked. So I, I eat all these pancakes. I am just, just stuffed to the gills. I run up to the car, jump into the car, grab, grab the edge of the car and swing in and I slam the door on my fingers. And, I, and I'm like, and there's like, there's a moment there where I'm thinking, I've cut off my fingers, I can't believe it. And because they just dis disappear up into the door hinge. And I, I open the door and they're they're kind of crooked, but they're immediately starting to swell. And I'm like, oh man, I, I don't know if they're broken, but I'm not climbing today. And so at any rate, so approximately three weeks passed, and the, the swelling went down, and I was ready to start climbing again. So okay, I am ready. I am ready for the hardest climb in Canada. We go back out to Squamish, and we go to the, the coffee shop, tall stack of pancakes again, run out to the car, swing into the car, slam the door. And I've done it again. <laughs> and, uh, no and so, at any rate, three, three weeks later, the swelling has gone down. I go back out again. I carefully get into the car, and 
that, and I go and do the climb, which was, I mean, compared to actually entering a vehicle, was, uh, <laughs> was pretty much child's play. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So it's a real thin finger crack, so you can't do it with swollen fingers. So that was, that was the other part. That was the crux of the climb. Supposed crux of the climb. Uh, okay, yeah, and then, um, yeah, this, so I just got onto bigger and bigger things. This is something called the Shadow in Squam. It's just like this awesome stemming corner. And so I kind of, I went up through the grades and, um, you know, got up onto harder and harder climbs. And I guess this was right at the end of when I was still living in Canada. And after this, I was kind of like, I don't know, you know, at least for Squamish, this is the coolest thing I could find. So, um, uh, Mary, getting married to someone who's in the audience somewhere. Somewhere here, um, to a, a California girl. There was like a number of reasons why I left Canada. <laughs> oh yeah, and so again, so like there's all kinds. You know, you, you think of like the highlights of your career, and you look at your resume, and you're like, oh yeah, this is the hardest on site event. This is probably yeah, it's probably one of the hardest on sites I did. It was the first free ascent, and it was it was all killer and everything. But one of the things with this is, so I did it, and then like, I don't know, I can't remember, maybe six months later or something, a local photographer, he really wanted to, photo to photograph me on this thing. And I'm like, oh, okay, sure, yeah, we'll go up there. And he goes, yeah, and I've, I've got the clothing for you. And I'm like, and all of a sudden, I'm starting to get nervous. And I'm like, so what are you talking about? He goes, oh, you'll, you'll see, it, it'll be great. So we meet at the coffee shop, and he pulls up this gold lycra. Like shiny gold light ray. And so I'm like, there's no, the, the photo shoot is off. I am not doing this. Anyway, so he's arguing with me. I'm like, okay, I'll go try it. And so I went into the bathroom of the restaurant and I pulled on these gold tights. And it's more embarrassing than you can imagine. It was like putting on my mom's underwear. And I'm like, it's off. I'm not doing this. And, and he goes, okay, well, we'll still do it. And I'm and, but the thing is, is, the close call on this was not whether or not I would do it. The close call is that this ended up on the cover of Climbing Magazine. This could have been me in gold life. And I would not be standing here right now if I, if I was photographed in gold life. Right? It would be way too traumatic. Anyway, so, I don't know, I'm kind of jumping all over the place. I'm not really very organized. But, um, anyway, so this is one of the early trips to Yosemite. But this is kind of like... You know, it's kind of funny. Nowadays, people are like, well, how do people deal with it when they didn't have cams or when they didn't have, like, modern climbing shoes? This is in EVs, and they were crap. And I'm wearing a swami belt and with no leg loops. And I've, I don't have camming devices. I just got stoppers. And this is butterballs down. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. anyway, and I've got, like, these ridiculous short shorts on. But this... this <laughs> Don't make this weird. <laughs> but, at any rate, this was state of the art back then. You know, this was actually reasonably cool, believe it or not. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, I can't remember, maybe like after five or six years of climbing, I started doing some soloing. This is down at Joshua Tree. And, um, you know, <laughs> soloing works for some people and it doesn't work for other people. For me, the main reason it worked was when I was still up in Canada, mid-afternoon, we would um, basically smoke out of it, and um, everybody, we would all go to the bakery, and this worked for a while for me. <laughs> Lots of donuts, but, um, so anyway, we would go to the bakery, and, and that was good for a while, but eventually I realized, you know, I love donuts, but I love climbing even more, so this one day, I just got them to drop me off at the, one of the cliffs on the way to the bakery in Spanish. And I said, I'm just going to go soloing it. And it was super easy stuff. Like 5.7s and 5.8s I had done a bunch of times before. And it wasn't like trying to do something rad. It was really just kind of like, I just didn't want to stop climbing. And that first time, I think it was maybe like within a few hours, I did like 1,000 feet or I don't know, 1,500 feet of climbing. And I'm like, this is this is unbelievable. It had nothing to do with braid or trying to be a daredevil or anything like that. It was just so cool. But, you know, over time, you know, sort of getting onto steeper, and, you know, different types of terrain. This is, again, this is uh, Josh the, um, uh, There you go. 
Something like that. <laughs> you, boy, you guys know way more than me. That's what I was saying. You guys have done like all these climbs that I have done. So what, why am I up here? Anyway, yeah, this is uh, yeah, horse and buggy, another Joshua Tree classic. I love the climb. So good. And then yes. you know, obviously doing all the rope climbing. This is up on Desert. something called Desert um, Reality or Desert Gold or something in, in Bedrock. It's not in Rome. Yeah, I know. I know what you're thinking. Totally poser shot. <laughs> and, I, I mean, I wasn't posing, but it, uh, it is a poser shot for sure. So, but, anyway, so, but this is the thing, like with, you know, you see these pictures and you're kind of like, I mean, you kind of see what you're going to see, but at this point here, right at that point, you know, my knees are up by my elbows, and you see that block that's sticking up by my chin? Okay, that thing is the size of like a really big suitcase, and right at that point, I grabbed in behind it, and it's detached, and the whole thing slid out about six inches. And I remember, I mean, in those kind of situations, think everything's happening really quick. You're thinking, okay, block will come out, it'll cut the rope, then I'll die. And, and I kind of like, at the last minute, kind of lunged in behind, got a hand jam, and groveled up, and it was just totally the pitiful, wimpy exit. It was not heroic at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes, Heroic shots, they don't tell the whole story, and certainly didn't with me. <laughs> okay, so um, my first trip abroad was over in Britain, over in, like I went to England and Wales and Scotland and, and stuff, and did a bunch of, the, the, like a lot of, you know, sometimes scary, um, sometimes with a rope, I did a lot of soloing over there, did a lot of sea cliffs, mountain cliffs, it's got to go there. But at any rate, um, in a way, like, my first trip abroad, I, I did all kinds of climbs that were way wilder than I ever thought I would do, or way more, in some ways, I guess, at least for me, heroic than I thought I would do. But the, the most amazing thing of the whole trip wasn't about actually climbing something, it was actually about falling off. So I went up to this cliff called Suicide Wall, and I was going to try this climb, and it was super sketchy, really hard, hardly any protection, and so I was kind of gripped out, so I'm trying to check it out. And so I climbed up to the base of this thing. This isn't on that climb. This is actually it might have been on that climb afterwards. But so I, I was trying to check it out, and you can't really see it. I'm looking for places where you might be able to get a protection. The guide looks crap. So at any rate, so I, I hiked up on the side, and then I cut across on this ledge to get a better idea of what was going on. And so I'm, I'm, get, I'm on this edge. I'm maybe like. 15, 20 feet above the ground, and it's hideous towels down below. So I'm trying to be careful. I'm looking up, trying to check out where the route goes, and having a hard time figuring it out. Keep on stepping back a bit, and all of a sudden, I slip, and I flip upside down, and I'm heading toward, head first towards the ground. And I, I should back up now. Anyway, so when I was a kid, I loved gymnastics. <laughs> I thought gymnastics were the coolest thing, and so I love watching on TV. And so I tried it in high school. And uh, so I would try to do the thing where you run along, you jump on the springboard, and you jump up, and you do a flip, and land perfectly. I could never do that. I'd have spotters and pads and stuff, and I would always land, and as soon as I got upside down, I was lost. And so I would just land in a crumpled heap. So at any rate, back, <laughs> flash forward to this point where I'm hurtling towards my desk. And it's gnarly boulders. It's just like the hideous talus down below. And I remember my arms were still at my side, and I'm just missiling towards the talus. And I remember it was the weirdest thing. It all slowed down to super slow motion. And I'm like, oh, all I have to do is do a backflip and land on my feet. <laughs> I, I mean, the thing is, is if I hit the ground, I'm going to die. There's... There's no two ways about it. It is the worst talus that I've seen. And so it was just like, it seemed like I had all the time in the world. I just flipped over backwards, did this perfect back flip, and the landing was hideous. And I had to land just perfectly, one foot over here, one foot like this, land, and it seemed like there was no impact. And I landed, I was kind of like, and my girlfriend was down around the corner, and I'm like, huh. And I walked down around the corner, I started to shake, and I tried to tell her what had just happened. And it, it I, was, I was positive when I was in high school that 
I just did not have the genetics to do backflips. <laughs> and on that day, when life, my life was on the line, it was, it was bizarre. I don't even know how to, how to explain it. But I, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm special. I think all of us are special. I think all of us have <laughs> I'm not kidding. No, I, 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 I swear, I, I just think sometimes there's stuff inside of us that is way more, way bigger than any of us know. Anyway, that's my Okay, so, yeah, back to traveling. Here I am de down in Australia. If you haven't been to Australia, you got to go. I swear, yeah. I've, Yosemite is awesome. It has El Cap, it has all those things. But as far as like the actual stone goes, I think some of the climbing down in Arapiles and uh, the Grampians is the most dreamy stone I've ever encountered in my life. Just, it looks kind of like sandstone, but it's made of steel. It's like the most bomber rock ever. Super fun. So solo. Went this in the right direction. This is something called Kachung. I mean, yeah, okay, so like here in Yosemite, you have something like separate reality, and it's like, I don't know, 511 or 512 or something like that. This is a, a roof that's almost as big, and it's 510. Yeah. Super, yeah, just, it's a rad place. Classic one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there's a campground down below. This is probably isn't even really interesting or anything, but um, <laughs> so you know, you, you, well, I mean, you go, you go climbing to be, I mean, heroic basically. You, you, you want to be a hero and you want to do rad stuff and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, it, so I I was camped by that red truck down there, and in the morning you just go to um, you, know, you pick a bunch of eucalyptus bark to make your campfires so you can make your coffee in the morning. And so they have all kinds of weird animals in Australia. They have, you know, they have the kangaroos and koalas and stuff like that. But they also have like the creepy stuff. Anyway, so this one morning, I come back, I got this huge load of a eucalyptus thing, and I get up early in the morning so everybody else is asleep. I come back, and I've got this huge load of eucalyptus wood, and it's just like up to my chin. And the, I'm not really scared of tons of animals. Really, I'm not really scared of any animals. It's like spiders, they scare the crap out of me. This huge, I don't know what they're called, bull spiders or something, size of like a trench, it's like twice as big, and it crawls <laughs> under my chin, and I sc just scream like a little girl, drop all the wood, and like there's all these like little puck tents all over the place, and all these heads stick out like, I don't know, I mean everybody's freaking out because I'm some little psycho is screaming about spiders. <laughs> like I say, it wasn't really a very interesting story. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so, but, but no matter what, I mean, like for a lot of us, particularly here, I mean, Yosemite has been such a defining part of our climbing, certainly our rock climbing. I mean, it is, through the ages, the most important rock climbing area um, in the world. And so, I was totally smitten, and, you know, we all, I mean, people talk about the idea of the golden age, and the, and the golden age... Help. I mean, it could be right now. It really is, you know, whatever you make it. Um, the one thing that, for, at least when I first started going to, to the valley, it was Mecca. And I mean, it is Mecca for a lot of us now. But, um, I mean, now a lot of people think, oh, no, Spain is like the place to go, or this place or that place. Um, but certainly, I was just drawn to it again and again and again. Just, oh, I actually was up in Tuolumne, but I'm you know, the same sort of thing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry, this is backwards. This is, this is the cookie, this is Red Zinger. But, <laughs> Probably a lot of you guys don't know this one. This is Tips down in Cascade Falls area. And this is one of those things where, you know, um, yeah, I'd go down there by myself and, and just go do this climb. And so I went and did it this one time, and um, it's like this hard 511 crack. And, and so I'm by myself, and, and so I, I, I climb up on this thing, and I get about halfway up, and I hear this cheeping sound. 
And I'm like, what the hell is that? I look around and I look inside the crack and there's this little bat and it's like coming towards my fingers. And so I start jamming faster. It starts like going faster. And the thing is, is I'm like doing these thin finger jams and he's doing like these arm or wing bars. And he's just and he's like, I mean, he's, he sees Vienna sausages like going away from him. And he's like, man, that's like the most awesome lunch I've ever seen. He's like chasing the other pack, and I'm trying to climb faster and faster, and he's going for it faster. And I've never seen, I mean, I've always thought off with climbing is kind of like a lane. It's kind of halfway between spelunking and climbing, and it's. it's just, I've, sorry, you guys. I've never really cared for it that much. Um, but anyway, so. I'm finger jamming, he's like wing barring, and he's like, he's gaining on me, I'm trying to climb faster, finally, I get away from this little brute, and I get up to the top of the thing, and for those of you who haven't done tips, tips is one of these climbs where it just kind of ends in the middle of nowhere, it just kind of ends at an anchor, and then you got to go down, and so I'm soloing, and I'm like, oh crap, man, I need to get back, I know he's waiting for me. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if he's a vampire, but he, 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 was certainly, he was certainly chasing after my fingers. And so I'm kind of like hyperventilating and, and like, you know, I, I, hyperventilating. It, it basically it oxygenates the blood. I mean, that's what they say. But I think mostly I was just freaking out. Anyway, so I'm just hyperventilating. I'm just like, holy crap, okay, get ready, get ready. And then I just start jamming down this thing as fast as I can. Again, he comes out of me, the cheating starts again. And, I can see inside the I mean, it's amazing how amazing his technique was. <laughs> At the same time, I'm seeing his razor-sharp teeth coming after my fingers. And he's coming out, and I just kind of do the big reach down below, and swing down, and get past him, and, and, I, and I escaped. And... <laughs> But I mean, the technique, I swear, the technique he had, like, in the speed, I mean, okay, I, I was able to climb faster than him, but he was able to do his body length a second. I mean, it, it, it really was pretty rad, but I did check my fingers in the end. I mean, I, I think a lot of us, you know, after we've done, like, a hard crack, you know, it is kind of like, point of pride, okay, did I cut myself? And, you know, I did check myself at the bottom, and I, I found it not even a nibble. Okay. I, I was pretty stoked. <laughs> okay, this is just um, some other... Oh, this is mo moon germs. Again, just some random crack in, in Yosemite, but over on uh, Elephant Rock. If you guys, for those guys, or girls, Miranda, I see you there. <laughs> um, this is a rad climb. It is so beautiful. This amazing thin crack, speckled with thin knots. It's kind of like the combo, thin crack, knob climb thing. It is a, a, a dreamy pitch. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. This is me failing on a new route in somewhere in the back country of Tuolumne. What? Huh? I, like I said, I failed. I don't need things I fail. <laughs> no, it was down by Glen Allen. Um, yeah, I, maybe somebody's climbed it now. Kind of ended on a super thin flag, and I was too scared to put cams behind it. This is just up on the rostrum, the rostrum roof. Or rostrum stuff. Um, but yeah, so, you know, Yosemite, yeah, it's been an incredible place. And, and for me, um, you know, I, I, I've enjoyed it for like, you know, the, the short, hard climbs and, and the big climbs and everything. But I think for me, um, at a certain point, I, you know, it was on the verge of when I was leaving Canada and I started coming down to Yosemite and I, I found how much fun it was to link um, multiple routes. And so for the first uh, few years, this is probably, I don't know, sometime back in the 80s, I can't remember when, and I would just like solo these moderate routes, like, you know, Sentinel and higher Cathedral Rocks and, and stuff like that. Um, and I didn't really know anybody. And so I would just do my own thing, and I was pretty sure nobody really knew anything about what I was doing. But one thing I had in mind for quite a while was the idea of, boy, with a rope, it would be so fun to try to do the nose and half dome in a day. And I knew the best person to do it would be John Dacker. And he was the most famous climber in the world, and he was in 
Gillette Razor commercials. I mean, that's how famous it was. <laughs> it, 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 it was pretty bad, but you know, I knew he would be the optimum partner, but I didn't know him, and there's no way I was going to try to approach him. And, and I really thought that, I mean, look, my, my friends thought that I was just ridic ridiculous to think I could even try to do something like this. But I came down this one season, and I'm just like, I, I so want to do this. I've been thinking about it for years. And I pull into the Reeds parking lot. I'd just driven down from Canada, and we haven't even gone to the, to the campground yet. And uh, so I stop at the parking lot, and I just figure, oh, I'll just go, you know, soloing up on Reeds. All of a sudden, I swear it was like fate or something. Back pulls into the parking lot, and I I can't even look at him because it's like royalty, right? You don't like go, hey, what's up? It's like the queen or something. <laughs> so I'm kind of like <laughs> trying to look any other direction than him, and he comes walking up and he goes, hey, Peter, do you want to go solo? And I'm like, how the hell does he know my name? I'm like, I'm a nobody from Canada, and somehow maybe some of the stuff. I, I don't even know how he knew I was doing this stuff in, in, in you know, soloing in, in, in the valley because I didn't know anybody there. Anyway, so I go climbing with him and right away he asked me about doing this project and it was just like, holy crap. Um, there's, there's, you know, so much of your life is it's just kind of like nuts and bolts and, you know, you just, you, you do what you want to do and you, everything goes is kind of like everyday work or everyday climbing or whatever. In this instance, it, I swear, when he asked me if I wanted to do this thing that I thought was the coolest thing in the universe, it felt like the planets were aligning or the mountain gods or fate or something had just said, look, everything's, you know, right here, ready to go. And, uh, and it, was, it, it was super, it was actually more dramatic than when we actually started to try Go for this thing. Anyway, so, um, but first of all, John was, he was like a really forward thinking thing, a forward thinking person. <laughs> I mean, at that point, he actually seemed like a thing or a god or something like that. But anyway, so he, he sort of laid down the ground rules. He said, okay, first of all, you have to take two rest days. And coming from Canada, you don't take rest days, it's, it rains all the time. And so I, so I'm like, I can't take rest days, you know, I'll get weak. In two days, I'll, I'll, I'll get completely weak. And he goes, no, no, you, you, you have to do two rest days, and you have to eat as much as you can. So it's just like, okay, here's one, th one thing that I really feel like I can't do because I'm going to get weak, and here's another thing I, I really don't want to do because I feel like I'm going to get fat. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, so he says, eat as much as you can. So I laid in my little pup tent, I had hardly any money, so I, I bought these big boxes of saltine crackers and lined the side of my tent with them. And I would just lay there and just eat crackers until I would pass out. And then, and then wake up and eat more crackers. And, I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. And the only reason I, I did it was because John said that it might work. And so, at any rate, so. I, I did it, and then the day of, you know, we wake up, I don't know, at 11 o'clock at night, and then, we're, so, in other words, so we're ready to go at one minute after, after midnight. And so we start up, and I don't really have a bunch of pictures of this, and so we start on the nose at uh, just after midnight, and uh, everything goes great, and, and luckily, you know, there's a lot of people on the nose because it's a popular route, and people are asleep, and so we're holding the, all the gear against our legs, trying to keep quiet as we sneak by them in the night. Um, and we, we cruise on, and we go higher and higher, and then um, about two-thirds of the way up, we pass, it, now it's daylight, and we pass a couple of parties, a party of three and a party of two, and they, they're really nice, and they let us go by. And we get maybe a few hundred feet higher, and we get to a point where I'm going to swing into the lead. We've kind of gone back and forth. I'm going to swing into the lead. And I get up to John, and there's like this flake. It's basically, well, as it turns out, it's the size of an idiot. Because <laughs> it's, it's, it's my height, and I jump onto it. I'm just jacked. Everything's going so well. I jump onto it, grab it, and the whole thing just peels off backwards. And it's like weighs hundreds of pounds, and I let go of it and jump back down onto the ledge. And John, who was, he, I mean, he was like the best climber in the world. He was like a superhero. 
And he, I remember he had like a white t-shirt and, and white shorts on, and he just lunges forward, this huge thing that's coming over, and as well, as I'm, seriously, as I'm jumping off, I'm remembering that we passed a party of two and a party of three. We're in a huge, massive uh, dihedral, and if this block comes off, it's going to ricochet back and forth, busting into pieces. It's going to kill at least some of them, and it's, it's all on me. And as I'm jumping down, and I, all this thing is just, just ricocheting through my head about what's going to happen, there's this white blur beside me, and it's John leaping forwards like a superhero and pushing this block back into place. It was rad. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love superhero movies. <laughs> that was the best. I mean, it, 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 it was just awesome. And I'm like, I'm, I'm standing on their ledge beside him and I'm kind of like hyperventilating and I'm like, oh man, John, I am so sorry. I, I can't believe I screwed up like that. <laughs> um, and he's like, oh man, it would have gone. I mean, he could have totally laid into me and told me what an idiot I was. And instead, he's just like, let's keep going. You know, it wasn't your fault. I mean, I was an idiot. I could have killed people that day. And John saved people that day. Um, and, that, and that's who he was. Anyway, so we continued on through to the top. Oh, it's just... Yeah, this is El Cap, and this gives you an idea how impressive we are to climb a pentagon. I forgot that picture was there. Anyway, so, hey, then, so get, get El Cap, and a lot of people know, how, how did you get from um, El Cap to Half Dome? And he's just like, oh, jumped out of a car and drove over the stables. It's really not that big of a deal. Anyway, so we're done with that part. Anyway, so then. So then we, we, we hike up to Half Dome, and uh, we're, we're all ready to go. And here, here we're all just like sucking back some water, and a friend hiked up and snapped a few pictures, and here's John giving me an awesome belay as I start up the first pitch. <laughs> Looking all heroic. I mean, I, I can't overemphasize how big of a hero John was. I mean, he, and, you know, nowadays, you know, some people are the best at bouldering, and some people are the best at big roots and this and that. John was, I, I really, in my view, I think he was, it was the last time we had a best, or, or a single person who was the best rock climber on the planet, in, in, in my view. <laughs> anyway, so here we are, way up high on the roof. But anyway, so, so now we're up on Half Dome, and, uh, you know, we're, we're there's people at various points on the route, and um, we're climbing, a hell of a lot of it. And uh, and there's there's like a number of places where I, I was in the lead, and we would get up there, and uh, these people would look at me, and they would go, "What what are you doing?" I'm like, "Well, I'm just climbing half dome," and they're like, "Well, you can't pass us." And and, and luckily, at each of these uh, junctures. Um, I knew that we, John and I had already figured out John was going to swing into the lead, so I would just go, oh, that's fine, and John would deal with it. John would come up, and um, at each of these times, they would start to make the same argument. They'd go, oh, wait a minute, you're John Backer, and, you know, clearly they watch TV and see the commercials for Gillette Razor. <laughs> so they would let him go by, but, but at this one point, so this is after, maybe over halfway, after the Robin's first after you, for those of you who've been there, you get up in these chimneys, but basically over halfway up the face, it's like a 2,000 foot face. There's one point, again, I'm going first, I get there, they're like, you can't pass. You know, we just don't do things like that up here. And then John comes up and I'm like, oh, oh, I guess you can't pass. And so John goes past, and we're in this corner system, and uh, John goes up and the rope starts running, running out, and then uh, I start climbing up, and this guy, who's belaying his buddy, he's not psyched on me past. And I'm, I'm kind of like, so I can't grab the hand crack in the back, and so I'm doing this weird stemming out in the corner. And John, he's thinking, well, Peter's at a 5'9 hand crack. He's not going to fall off. So I, I know he's running it way out. We're moving together. And, and so I'm climbing, and the guy's leaning up further and further, and he's not looking at me. I can, I can tell he's just 
hates me for some reason. <laughs> anyway, he's cool with John going past, but he's not cool with me going past. He doesn't get the idea that we're connected. <laughs> so I'm trying to get by the guy, and I can't grab the crack that would make it easy. And I'm doing this gimpy stemming thing, and I'm just trying to work past him. He's, and he won't look at me. He's leaning back further and further as I'm trying to get by him. I'm flipping one foot up, flipping one foot up, and it's getting to be really hard stemming. The thing is, if I fall off, I know John's way run out. He's going to fall a huge distance. John's my hero. I'm going to cause the death or dismemberment or certainly the injury of my hero. And uh, so I'm trying to get by this guy, and he's leaning back further and further, and it's just it's getting harder and harder the further I go. And it's all like mini moves because he's, he's kind of in my way. And so finally, I've almost passed him, and I kind of look up, and I can see this perfect stem for my left foot. And so I, I get ready, and I'm, I know I'm going to swing my foot up and look at it, and I, I palm up like this, and at the same time, swing my foot up as high as I can. At that point, what I didn't see was the guy lean back extra far, and my foot just fully connected with the side of his head. And It was awesome. I mean, his, his body fully just kind of ricocheted in, and, and like, I, I'm not really like a violent person or anything, but, but like a lot of us, you know, when I watch like a superhero movie, you know, and you see the good guy kicking the hell out of the bad guy, I do envision myself doing that. Um, and, and, and that was that. I mean, that, that was, I was doing that thing, and I was a, a superhero. <laughs> and it was awesome. I, I, I apologize. I'm Canadian, so that's what I do. But, but, but it really felt good. He, he didn't say a word, but yeah, maybe he was unconscious. <laughs> anyway, oh, yeah, actually, I should really go back. So, at any rate, so just after that, we get up to this ledge and uh, maybe like a few pitches higher and it was big sandy again for those of you who've been there it's like three quarters of the way up and there's these german guys there and so i climb up to the, at this point i'm in the lead now and these germans they're so psyched they see me and i've been climbing in in the valley a lot my hair is all bleached so it looked all blonde and stuff and they're all excited because they think that I'm John Backer. And I have to let them down. They're like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not John Backer. I'm, I'm, I'm just this guy from Canada. But John, he's just down below me. He's going to be here soon. So they're all psyched. John comes up, and they want to give us a picnic. They got all this German sausage. And... <laughs> Don't make it weird. This is bratwurst and stuff. <laughs> um, anyway, so... No, they, they, were, they were cool guys. Anyway, so... But... We're like, no, no, we've we got to keep going. But at this point, a storm comes along, like a lightning storm. And it's rad. Like, it's not like, it's like all of a sudden it's there, and it's just like lightning, and, you know, you think I've got a bad haircut now. When lightning, <laughs> like the electricity, our hair, they, I remember John and I were looking at each other, and our hair is just like sticking out like Einstein. It was, it was crazy. And, but it felt, that day felt so fateful that it was like the mountain gods giving us energy. It wasn't like, oh, maybe, maybe we should go down or, or something like that. It was more like, oh, man, we feel extra strong now. <laughs> because it's just like the storm gods are just giving us like an extra million volts. I mean, that's, seriously, that's how it felt. And uh, so we just surged onto the top. It was, yeah, we felt like superheroes at that point. And then, you know, once we kind of made that decision, um, you know, then the clouds started to clear up, and this is us. Yeah. You can see the clouds starting to clear up there. I know, fully triumphant. Yeah, we, we were so psyched. And, I mean, I've done all kinds of things where I barely made it because I'm so cooked, or I failed on things because I'm too tired. But on that day, I felt like we could have gone forever. I mean, it was one of those golden days, and I'm sure most or all of you guys have had those days, or guys and girls, <laughs> of where you just feel like nothing can stop, stop you. And it, 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 yeah. it's, it's an awesome thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this, so, anyway, yeah, this is my favorite, favorite shirt. I felt that one more climb left in it. 
And the cool thing was, is, so at this time, John, he was importing uh, the new Boreal shoes, b rays which were kind of like this revolutionary climbing shoe. And they also did some t-shirts and clothing and stuff like that. And a few years later, I saw this picture in, in, the, in their catalog, and this was in the t-shirt section. And the, and the shirt on the left is, is the shirt that they market, and the one on the right is the inferior Canadian version. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did see that for that one. Yeah, it was awesome. Okay, so, yeah, now I'm jumping into a totally different continent. This is over in uh, um, Asia. This is in, going into the Karakoram. And, you know, I think for a lot of us, the first time you come to Yosemite, it is the most dramatic, awesome place you've ever been. It's way beyond anything you, you've experienced. And when I went, in, went to Pakistan, I kind of experienced a similar type of thing. This is some women doing something with weed. <laughs> I know it, 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 sounds, it sounds totally pleasant, but like, we were told you can't talk to the women. You can't talk to the women and you can't take pictures. And so, and one of the guys on the trip, of course, he starts taking pictures of the women. But, man, you, go, you go over there and, you know, you're supposed to be all, you really should be understanding of different cultures, but at the same time, you go over there, women are doing all the work and the guys are drinking all the coffee and playing soccer or whatever. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's pretty weird because, the, okay, when I first, I remember when we were fully getting into the mountains, it, saw, it looked kind of like Shangri-La, you know, these beautiful uh, apricot orchards. And then you go up further and you go into these villages and you see these little girls, women and old women, carrying these huge stacks of firewood or big baskets of apricots. And then you go a little bit further and there's the men drinking tea and the boys playing soccer. It's, it's, it's a dr I don't know. It, it, it's hard to come to terms with. Um, but at any rate, uh, yeah, so we went into these mountains and it was incredible. This is one of the guys on our trip. I don't, he really didn't have a clear job description. He clearly really religious. Um, he would be, he'd be praying all the time. Total jackass. He, no, I'm no, serious. He, he stole from like the cooks and the porters and everything. And... Um, he made a stop at this one village, and it turned out later that he stole all this stuff from the other people, the, the porters and stuff, like uh, headlamps and stuff, just so he could sell it to his cousin. You know? And then when we talked to the, uh, the, the porters and stuff, for the, the way they explained it was, oh no, um, no, you have to understand, he's a rich man. Like in other words, that explained everything. And, well, I guess it's kind of like here. <laughs> No, this is, this is Muhammad. Um, <laughs> the only way if we could out older him was we wouldn't let him use our climbing shoes. Um, he, he was rad though. But yeah, so this is, you know, like I say, the first time I came to Yosemite, unbelievable. It's such an incredible place. It blew me away ten times over. This is the next place that did it to me. That, those pinnacles in the foreground, that, that's like a 2,500 foot wall. So you'd see these huge walls, and almost all of them formed into these perfect pinnacles, and then in behind them, mountains above them. It was kind of like mountains above mountains above mountains. It was crazy in there. This is, so there's three of us who went in there. Gail and Raoul, he is like this adventure photographer. <laughs> Awesome guy, kind of like a genius. Um, I mean, whenever we went climbing, he would always be explaining to me kind of like these mental things about, I don't know, how there isn't really such a thing as color. It's the way that, I don't know, sort of atomic things bounce off of it. I could never understand it. I mean, I'm just like, I just want to grab that hold. And he's like trying to explain the universe to me, and I could never really get it. But, but, so he is like a genius, and I'm kind of like a caveman. And then, so we're on this trip though, and this one day, he takes off and he, he rope solos this beautiful pinnacle thing. And he comes back at the end of the day, and he is jacked, and he just wants to tell us all about it. And he's still in his harness, and he's just telling us all about his climb. I'm like, wow, that really sounds amazing. You know, he, sounds, he did an incredible climb. 
And he goes, yeah, yeah. And then finally he's done with the bragging, I mean, sharing. Um, and he, he says, yeah, but, you know, when I get back, I'm going to have to write a letter to Petzl because, you know, this harness they've got, you know, it really doesn't work very well. Um, you know, the, the, the equipment loops don't really work. The buckle is super hard to access. And I'm like, Galen, you've got that thing inside out. <laughs> he goes, no, that, that, that can't be right. That can't be right. And I'm like, no. Like, you got like the labels and stuff like on the outside. It's just like it's, it's all inside out. It's just, like, the guy's like a rocket scientist, and he just he couldn't even he didn't even know how to dress himself. <laughs> it was, yeah, bizarre thing. But it, it, again, 99.9 percent .9 of the time he's way smarter than me. But that 0.1 percent it is just golden time for me. I get to be a little bit smarter. Than him. And this this is Conrad. Conrad Anchor, awesome guy. Yeah, for those of you who know, he is, he's just the awesome guy. Maybe one of the very best or best all-around climbers I've ever climbed with. He is, he's just heroic. He's just like the coolest guy to climb Everest and all that kind of stuff. And <laughs> I know he looks kind of big right there. But, but it, it's not really his fault. Like over in Pakistan, so we're driving along and there's like these little pot plants on the side of the road. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> you can pick them like daisies. And so, again, it's not, it's not really his fault. And um, anyway, awesome, awesome climber, and we all have our weaknesses. <laughs> Maybe it's a strength, I don't know. <laughs> so, it, so when we first get there, I'm just so jacked. I run up the valley way ahead of the other guys, and, and I mean, here's a, a one piece of advice I would give you is when after you've been flying for like 30 hours or whatever, don't try to exert yourself too much because I came down with bad cold, turned into a lung infection, and this is what the first couple of weeks of our trip was, was Ibrahim here bringing me tea and lemon because I had like this really, I, I didn't actually heal up until I got back to the States, um, so I just lay in a tent for most of the time. But just super good guy. Every morning, this is what it was. But, in this area, this is the Cherakusa Valley. Any of you are thinking of going there, go there. It, you're surrounded by like these, you know, almost every peak is at the top of it is formed into a pinnacle. There's L cap sized walls, huge ice faces, mixed faces, all kinds of stuff. It's incredible. Yeah. This is one of the 7,000 meter peaks there. It, it's utterly rad. But one of the things, uh, basically the thing that caught my eye more than anything was this big kind of brown rock buttress there. It's about 8,000 feet long. And uh, I wanted to do it so bad as soon as I saw it, um, but I was way too sick for most of the trip. And even at the end, I was, I, I was still really kind of coughing a lot, but we decided to go for it, Conrad and myself. And so, originally, we were, we, you know, we're finally down. We've only got a couple of days left on our whole trip. And... Um, we're going to get up at 3 in the morning. And so at 3 in the morning, we get up and it's raining. The weather's been really good the whole trip. So we're like, oh, no way. So we go back to sleep. 4 o'clock, still raining. 5 o'clock, still raining. And 5.30, still raining. So we get up and we're just like, well, I guess we're not going to be able to do this thing. We're due to leave really soon. And so one of the things on, on this trip, so, you know, a lot of you, you know, you've been on big trips, you've been sponsored by different companies. Sometimes they just pay for the whole trip. Sometimes they give you food or whatever. Well, the thing that we were really stoked on this trip, we were sponsored by Pete's Coffee. And so we were going to be there like two and a half weeks. There was three of us and they gave us 17 pounds of coffee. And so we decided, well, we're not going to be able to do this climb. So we start drinking coffee and more coffee and more coffee. And finally, we're so jacked that we've got to do something, so we decided to go for it anyway. And now it's way later than the time. And we know that we can't, it's, it's, it's one of these things where it's so big that if we take baby gear, it'll take too long, and so anyway, we go for it. And it turns into this epic, you know, it's a shade under 24 hours, but it was just all day long, and this is what it was like. It was like the dream climb. It was like what I've been looking for all my life. 8,000 feet of pretty much like this. A little bit of 511, mostly easier, but, and after the first couple thousand feet, um, if we'd had to retreat, we couldn't. We just 
We had a single 60 meter row, we didn't have to deal with it. So it was up and over. Nobody had climbed the peak, so we didn't know what the descent would be like. And it was just awesome. This is actually a picture that Galen took from, he hiked up way up on the side. And I remember this belay where I tied off and leaned way out over the edge so I could look down on Conrad. And that, I mean, it was, it was kind of like the most rad Yosemite climbing in that kind of a setting. Unbelievable. Yeah, and that final thing, I was talking to somebody, maybe you're in the audience, um, I can't remember what your name was, but you're talking about the Mathis Crest. This is like the super extreme version of Mathis Crest. Like that, that next section there, through to the summit, is maybe like 3,000 feet. And places would be straddling, and finally you kind of get so weirded up by straddling, you swing down the hand traverse, then your arms get tired, and you straddle it again. And then when we finally got to the top, the very top, it was just a blade of granite you just do a pull up on and right at that point the sun went down and then we headed down the other side. It was just the dream, like I say, the dream climb. And then we had to descend through the night because we didn't have Vivi here and we just knew that basically it was too cold to try to stop in Vivi. We just would have froze to death. So we just kept on climbing. And here we are at the end. I know he looks baked again. I think he's just tired. <laughs> But, oh yeah, at this point, so there's the cups of coffee. So anyway, so we're like 22 hours into our thing, and we had told our buddy Ibrahim, you know, the guy with the tea and the lemon and all that kind of stuff, we had told him, you know, basically what was going to go on, but, you know, he didn't really speak English that well, and we didn't obviously speak Urdu or whatever it's called. And so he's super worried about us. He stayed up all night long, and he sees our headlamps way up there, and it's kind of like this gnarly moraine, like... For those of you who don't know what moraine, it's basically rocks inside of rotten mud. And it's, it, anyway, so it was super steep. So he sees us coming, and he knows that we're like, you know, coffee freaks. He brews up coffee, and in the half light, this is after we got down, it was mostly dark, the stars are still out. We see this headlamp coming up towards us. He's climbing <laughs> this, this type of terrain where it's super dangerous, and you need both hands, and he's got Mud, big mud coffee in each hand coming up towards us and it is just like one of the kindest things that anybody has ever done to me in my life and he comes up with this coffee and um, yeah it was pretty sweet but yeah that so yeah that that trip back to that again you know you, you go to places thinking you know you want to be heroic and you want to do amazing things but so often it's just like the weird stuff that happens along the way. And this is just some random peak that was, you know, in this area that we were at. <coughs> and it, it, I don't know, it, like I say, we all have our different reasons for, for going climbing. We, we want to climb harder, we want to climb higher. But so often, the things that really, I don't know, define the way that we look at how we view life are, are these weird, unexpected things that happen along the way, like, you know, some creepy little bat showing me the most awesome crack technique that I've ever seen, just absolutely fluid. Or Ibrahim, that guy, bring up those cups of coffee. Um, like, it was kind of the most amazing example of goodliness that <laughs> I've ever experienced. And then as well, um, you know, even the act of kicking somebody inside the head can be a righteous moment. <laughs> uh, so, I guess if I was going to give any advice, it would be get out there and, yeah, kick some ass. <laughs>
you're this endless kid. Like I'm watching you up here and we're all listening to your stories and it's that you see it as play. It's like this really epic adventure play. No, but it keeps you very young. So congratulations. I can't yeah. wait to go crofting soon, right? <laughs> so any, any questions out there? Any questions for Peter Croft? Um, I have a question for you. Yeah, go for it. America wants to know, do you really drive a Mini Cooper? Uh, I do. He tri and he drives a Mini Cooper. <laughs> See, it's awesome. I just drove from Bishop today. It is so fun. <laughs> See, he's always playing. It's like you're in a video game. It's like you are that sort of hero adventure you know, working in like the it's Legion a, of Doom and against like the it is superheroes. The it is, that is the idea. It's supposed to be fun. But I want to back up. So earlier in the show, you're talking about, okay, so, you know, we we're kind of smoked out a little bit and we realized that we forgot our rope and our rack and our harness. And is that really the, the genesis of your soloing is that you were so baked, you guys just forgot all of your equipment and you were forced to go soloing? Not true. Kind of true. Did I really say that? No, I mean, maybe, maybe no, you I mean, implied it, yeah. I mean, we did that for a while with the whole oh, the open donuts thing. But then I decided, I made a, I made a life choice. Yeah, it was stay like, alive. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the donuts are, are climbing in. Because donuts will kill you. Soloing, no problem, right? <laughs> donuts are deadly, dude. Stay away. Any other questions out there? Peter Croft? Yeah, go for it. What was that? Go again. Moon germs. Moon germs. What about it? Uh, What's a beta? It's near, it's near a tree. I mean, I don't really remember, like, cosmic debris is, there's, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I, I just remember a, a finger crack. Big pardon? Does anybody, well, I didn't do the first ascent. That was a back, another backer route. I, I just climbed it. Anybody else climbing moon germs? Anybody? No one's climbing that thing at all. It's so obscure. Nobody we're going to bring it back into fashion, though. Who wants to go climb moon germs tomorrow? Yeah, we're all going. So speaking of the progression, dude, going and climbing things, and, and like the progression of you and Backer went to the, you know, El, El Cap and Half Dome first, and then Mount Watkins is added in that 24-hour period, and the nose gets broken, right? You yeah. had that early nose record, and then with, with Hans Florin, and then it finally got broken after like 10 years, and then Honnold now kind of free soloing El Capitan. With that progression, do you feel that that leaves one behind or pulls one forward? You know, like that oh. outer edge, again that keeps going and going. Oh, I, I mean, stuff that's going on now, Alex, and not just Alex, Sure. is super inspiring. It just, I mean, for me, it just gets me super psyched. I mean, how can it not? Right? How can you not be so stoked? Yeah. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I, I know, I mean, it, 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 like I said, kind of at the beginning, you know, for me, it's, it just feels pretty awkward just coming up and trying to talk, in essence, from this stage down to all these people who are totally getting after it in Yosemite. It's, it's, it's super inspiring. You know, you guys are, it, for me, it, it's just, it just jacks me up just hearing all the stuff that's going on over here. Well, it was interesting so, when you started awesome your show, guy. everybody was so quiet. Everybody's like leaning in. They're like, what's he going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to learn. Like, seriously, like your words and wisdom and your decades of, of doing go it. With the, the crap. <laughs> Is he a wise guy or what? Come on, give it up for Peter Crock. Yeah, let's hear it. You're in? What did you think when Bill Price um, did the paintings with Next Sentence? Bill Price? Yeah. Ah, uh, you know, I actually didn't know that. Yeah. I, uh, I, I remember, you know, I, I guess one, one thing that kind of blew me away is when uh, the cringe got done by Backer. If right. Ray Jardine did it in three pictures with friends, and Backer on sided it with Hexes, the whole thing in one pitch. With stoppers and hexes, but I, I didn't know about Bill. Bill is kind of like a, a total unsung hero. Of yeah. The alley. But also, last time, um, you know, Cal fell on the following uh, from Cringe from Dr. Like, Red. Is that, yeah. So it's kind of interesting times, but like when uh, Croft, I mean, I'm sorry, when Price um, did that on hexes, so he, so he, was, he, he 
Move by move, let's see it, Dave. Go. Someone get him a chalk bag right now. Send it, Dave. Spot him right now. So he lowers all this rope down, right? And now he's all gone out. So he's, so he's, he's lowered the rope to get hexes, and he pulls it up, pulls it up, and then gets the hexes in the water. That was just rad, man. Yeah, that was rad. Was that rad, everybody, or what? Yeah! Give that right now. Yes, dude. Well, theater major. major. I, I, I got an awesome jackass moment, and it was actually me being the jackass. Um, Bill and Ray Jardine, they were working on Phoenix. And I don't know what we were doing, but somehow we heard that they were over there, and we were over by Reeds, and so we hiked down like um, Cascade Falls. And we found these um, before we left the, the road. We found these big um, highway cones, those big orange cones, and we went down there. And Jardine, who was kind of infamous for at that time, now it's not a big deal, but at that time he was infamous for hang dogging. And so we stuck down in the forest with these big orange highway cones and we were yelling, hang dog, hang dog, and he couldn't see us. And he was freaking out, he was looking at the whole place and he was like pointing to Bill, just like, lower me quick, lower me quick. Heckler, wow. And you called me the jackass. Hold up on, dude. No, it, it wasn't a proud moment for me, but it was fun. <laughs> You're so Canadian. You love being bad because it feels so good, but then you have to say sorry. We don't let you. Last question. Anybody else got a question there? Right here. Yeah, I got one. I'm also from Squamish. I've made a point of following your lines for us. Uh, well advised. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. I want to say thanks for having such a crazy eye for good lines. And, uh, I did a lot of bad ones. Maybe just disown all the bad ones. I don't know. <laughs> I tried to forget about it. It was short memory. It wasn't really a question. Yeah. And, uh, one, one question to you: What size inseam for the shorts did you wear? Was it like <laughs> short shorts? I don't know. Maybe if I actually got the shorts, I could send some of the hard. Let's not go there. All right, make some noise for Peter Kroc. Okay. So, so um, is MG here with the Sarvan? Is MG here? So right here. So come on up here, real quick.